Listen to the birds. Feel the wind. Embrace the open air. Build harmoniously with the landscape. Buildings should flow with the surrounding nature rather than contrast. These were the greatest influences on the architectural work of Marion Manley. As the second female to be licensed as an architect in the state of Florida and the first in Miami, Marion Manley contributed greatly to the development of South Florida. She was commissioned to design private homes throughout her career and made contributions to the design of the public buildings in the area. She was also the leading force behind the design of the University of Miami campus. Manley produced structures that were practical for Florida's climate and always sensitive to the local terrain. Her work covered over 50 years, from 1918 to roughly 1973, with her buildings and designs spanning from South Miami to Sarasota. However, throughout her life, Manley received little recognition for her work, with her male colleagues receiving most of the credit. Despite her strong personality and extraordinary talent, she remained a virtual unknown in the still male-dominated profession. Marion Isidore Manley was born in Junction City, Kansas on April 29, 1893. She was the youngest of the nine children of Charles Haynes Manley and Marion Isidore Jones. Not much is known about her childhood other than the fact that she had a very liberal upbringing in Kansas, a hub for the American women's rights movement of the time. This laid the foundation for Manley to become a strong, independent, forward-minded individual. After attending the University of Kansas for three years, she transferred to the School of Engineering at the University of Illinois. Therefore, Manley was able to obtain an education equal to that of the men of the time, and was able to begin her study in the field of architecture. She was the only female graduate to obtain a Bachelor of Science in Architecture in the University of Illinois class of 1917. At the same time, out of the 264 women attending the university, she was one of 14 elected to Phi Delta Psi, the Women's Honorary Society. Once she graduated in 1917, Manley briefly lived in Philadelphia to assist in designing ships in an emergency fleet for World War I. She then moved to Miami at the behest of her brother Lester, who had recently been contracted to pave Flagler Road, the first major thoroughfare in the growing city. On September 6, 1918, Manley became the second female to receive an architectural license in the state of Florida. Upon closer examination of the license she received, evidence of Manley's ongoing struggle as a woman in a man's world is revealed. The Florida State Board of Architecture failed to replace the his within the document to her, showing that there were so few women in the field that no one even thought to change it or even looked. Nevertheless, by 1924, she was already opening an independent office, taking advantage of the newly developing towns in South Florida. Her early private and public works contained the Mediterranean influences present in the other structures in the area. Due to the high brightness and hot climate of South Florida, architects at the time used open, flowing Mediterranean styles, so Manley continued the trend. In addition, she worked on many government buildings in the growing cities, including Springview Elementary School in Miami Springs and the Miami Post Office and Federal Building in downtown Miami from 1930 to 1933. It was around 1940 when Manley became involved in what was going to be her most extensive and noteworthy contribution to South Florida, the University of Miami. She began by sketching designs for proposed university buildings and layouts. When the United States began preparing for World War II in 1941, however, Manley was hired to do much more. Over the course of the war, over 9,500 civilians and military trainees went through war training courses at the new university, and Manley was the primary architect used to continue the school's growth. Another rather impressive war-related contribution she made was showing her building techniques and materials to Russian architects to assist them with the vast post-World War II Soviet reconstruction problem. In 1941, as the male architects of Miami left for war, Manley became the president of the South Florida chapter of the American Institute of Architects. 
She left Miami during the summer of 1942 to take an architectural planning course at MIT. Manley returned in 1943, sketching dozens of additions and adaptations to the school's buildings and serving as the university architect. With the university president Bowman Ash in Atlanta for a year, Manley was practically in control of the architectural work. In 1945, she introduced another architect, Robert Law Weed, into the U of M project, and the two became the spearhead of what would be called the University of Miami Expansion Project. Weed was paid double the salary of Manley. After helping lay out around 100 temporary buildings known as the shacks for thousands of incoming veterans, the two architects continued designing future permanent structures and the layout of the university as a whole. Their projects included the master plan for the main campus, the memorial classroom building, the veterans housing building, now the school of architecture, the Ring Theater and the Student Recreation Center, which has been renovated since. Other contributions Manley made to the Miami campus included the Baptist Student Center, the Canterbury Preschool, and St. Bede's Episcopal Church. In addition to Manley's outstanding work in her field, her personality and life outside work also form an interesting and unique story. Marion was a woman ahead of her time. She was a very strong woman. Um, she was a smoker, uh, smoked cools, a drinker. Um, she was a good shot. Um, very strong-willed. Uh, both in her professional life and her personal life. Uh, stories of her climbing up on the roof with a contractor to make sure things are done right, that sort of thing. Um, family gatherings went on her timetable. Um, oh, she, she was a, a great storyteller. Uh, just a character. She was a hoot to be around. Just a hoot. Well, she was a, uh, an interesting person to visit with any time, I remember that. And as a rule, if you wanted to stop and see her, she'd open the door for you. And not just for me, but for other people too. Although in the professional world she was referred to as Marion, those closest to her always knew her as Archie, nicknamed as such because of her passion for architecture. Archie used to call me and ask me to go uh, to have tea in the afternoon. She always liked tea. I guess, I don't know, if Archie was going with some friends to uh, some projects in the Florida Keys, and someone was asking Archie, what color should I paint, paint the house? And, <laughs> and she would say, well, you know, I can tell you the color that you can paint the house, but I'm going to have to give you a bill. <laughs> Yes, and I met her in her 80s, and even then she had a strong personality. Don't you? She she was not a she was something else. Uh, as I said before, uh, Marion was ahead of her time. Um, it is believed through family stories that she did subscribe to an alternative lifestyle. Um, she never married a man did have a series of female companions and housemates. Um, she would vacation in Key West with them. Um, she wasn't afraid to show it. I don't believe she flaunted it, but uh, she wasn't afraid to show it. Um, she was ahead of her time. In addition to her many private relationships, one of the most important associations she made, both in her personal and professional life, was with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was another, more widely recognized female pioneer of early South Florida. She worked as a conservationist of nature reserves throughout the country, but focused primarily on the Florida Everglades. 
Manly and Douglas first met through the women's clubs forming within the developing city of Miami. The two became very close friends, and in the midst of the Great Depression, Manly moved in with Douglas for financial reasons. Their relationship also affected Manley's work. Douglas's ideals of conservation and sustainability made their way into many of Manley's architectural plans, which often involved the use of sustainable resources and minimal damage to the surrounding environment. In addition to being conscientious of the environment's safety, Manley also used building surroundings to her architectural advantage. Yeah, but it was very interesting, and you can see here in the drawings, she indicates the predominant breezes. Look, look at how she does it. At the time, there was no AC, no internet. Okay, and then look at here. Look at this arrow. Most welcome breezes. Yeah, this is, I thought that was really great. She would always pay attention to that. Manley was very sensitive to the socioeconomic imbalance that existed in Coconut Grove. She donated herself, working pro bono, to the designing of a housing project and daycare in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the area, after joining the Coconut Grove Slum Clearance Committee. Many of her private works also took place in Coconut Grove and the adjacent town of Coral Gables, making up a majority of her earlier and later works. She helped mold the face of the area with homes, a business center, and a religious center. In addition to her South Florida works, Manley also designed an addition to the John Ringling Museum in Sarasota, specifically to house the reconstructed Oslo Theater. One of the best portrayals of Manley's character comes in her actions concerning the City of Miami Planning Board. After being a member for four years, in 1946, she resigned from the board because, quote, It bore no relation to planning, and I could not convince the other members of that fact. In 1973, in an interview with the Miami Herald, she said, They knew something should be done, but they didn't know what. Now, we are beginning to see the need for real planning and real guiding. The difficulty is that while we are attempting to correct mistakes already made, we are making the same foolish mistakes over and over again. Looking at the urban problems we see in Miami today, including traffic congestion and overbuilding, it's obvious that her assessment was spot on. The greatest characteristic Manley had was being ahead of her time. She used modern designs in areas fighting to stay traditional and was sensitive to the environment years before sustainability was even a consideration in construction. She lived with women and was a woman in a profession that is still male-dominated to this day. Although she did receive the Bertha Foster Award and was made a fellow within the American Institute of Architects, Marion Manley's name is not recognized outside of the architectural community. Women like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Julia Tuttle are very well known throughout the area, and Manley's contributions were just as significant. By the time of her death on February 18, 1984, at the age of 90, her accomplishments had included designing an entire university, numerous private homes, and multiple government buildings, along with devoting large amounts of time to urban planning, sustainability, and underprivileged sectors of South Florida. And, if she had been a man, she undoubtedly would have received far greater credit. Marion Manley's sensitivity to the landscape and her devotion to the development of South Florida made her one of the most important pioneers of Miami, which is why we are proud to call Marion Manley our great-great-aunt. Her desire to listen to the birds, feel the wind, embrace the open air, and build harmoniously with the landscape made her truly ahead of her time. <laughs>